So well, there we go. Welcome, and uh, it's great to see you back after our, our little break, our big break, a few months. Uh, today, October the 12th, uh, and uh, I want to share with you things that I see and read, listen to, that are provocative in a certain way that arouse uh, a, a certain set of questions. They always arouse, a, I think, a different uh, set of questions. And these questions are, are questions that uh, are good to talk about. I think they help me when I talk about them with you, which is in a way part of why I, I enjoy this class so much, because it's really a, a working laboratory for uh, a lot of ideas in it. And it, you're almost like a focus group too, uh, for me to, to uh, enable me to see what, what flies and what doesn't fly and, and what the, the mood is and what the sentiment is among a really important cross-section of, of our community. Um, we are, uh, you know, half a month away from the end of the holidays. Uh, and, um, you know, during the holidays, all of us had different kinds of experiences. Some of us had experiences in the synagogue. Some of us had experiences outside of the synagogue. Some of us had experiences online. And, um, indoor, outdoor, you know, and, and various forms of family activity and not. And, and uh, in general, mostly because the weather was good, I think it was a very successful uh, period for us in particular. Um, and I think it gave uh, people a semblance of, of normalcy, uh, albeit not completely normal. You know, we, we, we just don't feel that we have the, the, the same degree of freedom that we had before um, the synagogue was well attended, but uh, not fully packed uh, as it had been in, in past years for lots of different reasons. Uh, people who had signed up uh, for their seats uh, back in, let's say, July, uh, made a decision, you know, in, in September that that they just weren't feeling right, and you know that of course was was their their right and. Uh, Many people came by the shul, picked up machzors, and and pulled out uh, my manual from last year and did the service at home, which on the one level is very gratifying because it, it means that uh, people want to use the the that manual uh, from year to year. On the other hand, it just tells it, it it's a barometer reading of where we are in the pandemic in terms of how people are are feeling uh, relating to to being back together, and of course the main phenomenon that has happened is the this phenomenon, the, the rise of tele-Judaism uh, and um, or internet or Zoom services, uh, which, which you know, I, I've struggled with for quite a while, uh, but, but I'm very curious about it. And so I dip into the services, the recordings of services in, di in different synagogues. And because I, I, you know, dip into that on YouTube or whatever, my YouTube feed brings me uh, certain highlights of different services, one of which I want to share with you right now. So I'm just going to bring it up here and uh, uh, I'm going to, I want to get your reaction to this.
Sorry, boom, and back to everybody. Okay, we we, we are back uh, here. Okay, well, let me just put a frame around it in context, and and um, and then I want I want your reactions. Uh, this was, I believe, the second day Rosh Hashanah at uh, Park Avenue Synagogue. Park Avenue Synagogue, uh, one of the most popular online synagogue services now in America with tens of thousands of views um, and many, many uh, of our own congregants who enjoy going to Park Avenue precisely because a uh, phenomenal <coughs> production quality. I mean, it's really professional television, you know, uh, uh, production quality uh, to the Chazan Azi Schwartz is uh, pretty much uh, in the top tier of Chazanim in the country. Um, and uh, I'm, I'll, I'll leave off uh, uh, any other um, remarks right now. But that, that's, so this was the second day of Rosh Hashanah at the end of the service. Um, and um, and uh, uh, the accompanying band was the brass section of the Metropolitan Orchestra and it, uh, accompanied by uh, members of Park Avenue Synagogue who are musicians. Okay. Well, the floor is yours. What do you think? React. Anybody want to react? Go ahead, Fruth. Well, I think Safam would be excited because that was Safam's um, song. Um, but I, I, it was a per, it was perfect for the cat skills, right? Did anybody feel like they were watching the show on the cats in the cat skills? I mean, it was, if, if, if it hadn't been for the memorial plaques in the background, you would have thought you were in the cat skills. <laughs> okay, so, so actually, uh, just one correction, Ruth. Uh, it's, it's called the Rus, uh, the, the um, uh, I'm sorry, the Rosenblatt Kaddish. It's a, it's a cantorial Kaddish. Oh. I think it's the Mojitzer oh. uh, Hasidic oh, okay. Kaddish. Uh, and and Safam actually uh, did a, a, a setting of the Kaddish similar to that, I think, uh, way, way back, uh, you know, dozens of years ago. Go ahead, Bonnie. You know, I, I know some people who were, um, attend those services. I had no idea. To me, it looks like a Broadway production, <laughs> like they were going to see a Broadway show. Okay. All right. So so I, 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 I'm, I don't want to, you know... I, Yes, good. Okay. Any any other reactions, Go, Ellie? Uh, it's we're we're mixing up two things and we're trying to make them the same. We are not used to that kind of a reform congregation. If we were if we were there, 
in life, in, in reality, rather than in virtual, we might have said, well, this is not for us, or it is for us, you know, so we're, we're taking something that we're not comfortable with, that's not our own comfort zone, and we're saying, now we put it on video, and that makes it good, bad, or indifferent. I don't know whether it's a good comparison. So, okay, I, your comment is important in the sense that what's the context here, and who are, you know, where, where are we in all of this, and, and, and I think that, you know, part of, part of that is Bonnie's question. I think, I think it's everybody's question in the sense, you know, and, and um, I, 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 I want to say that, that um, I have a reaction to it musically and I have a reaction to it religiously and I have, you know, all sorts of things like that. And, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll kind of tease that out in a second. Go ahead, Marlene. Well, because it isn't our way of davening, my question is, is it better to have something and some connection to Judaism and prayer than nothing at all. I think that's a it's a it's a phenomenal question. Okay, and and uh, it's this is um, this is really one of the lines here. the 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 lines here is so what I mean, you know. I mean, if I put it into a different context, which is what's the what is the purpose of this uh, kind of uh, setting uh, within within the worship experience? Um, and, and, or, you know, and, and to my, you know, to, to be self-critical, say, am I, am I being too, too, too critical here of that, you know, and taking it way out of context uh, for, for that? Maybe it was just about fun, but go ahead, Diane. I just want to clarify, Park Avenue Synagogue is a conservative it's synagogue. It's a conservative synagogue, right. That's, I'm sorry, Ellie, you, you mentioned it's reform, it's conservative. Marlene, uh, second comment. Yeah, my, my additional comment is, that I, I'd like to know what did the Orthodox think when Chabad came in with its I, I, I's and its I, I, I's? So what you're saying really is, if I can just rephrase the question, is at what point do, do we go for that, uh, you know, that, that modality of, of worship? At what point do we add in the, the you know, a, a form or a genre of music that is going to capture, capture or captivate uh, the 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 congregation. Yeah. Okay. Also, Rabbi, you yeah. played a prayer that's a hallelujah prayer. It's praise of God. It's how we feel about God. You didn't have the orchestra playing Kol Nidrein. Da, 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 da. Yeah. And so that the meaning was not exactly what the in every occasion what the prayer was saying okay go ahead diane <laughs> I, also, I also think you're seeing the end result we don't know the transition that this no, synagogue course. made and, 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 to get and, to this end and i'm sure they didn't come to full orchestration and and hallelujah singing overnight i i agree and 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 so i i'm i'm gonna make my own disclaimer here that that of course i'm taking it out of context uh you know i don't i and and you know the context probably was it's the end of the service and at the end of the service we're all we all get a little bit you know uh, restless and and this this is um, an effective way of kind of containing that and 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 that that you know needs to be stated too and that's part of you know the the discussion I saw another hand go ahead Terry you're muted I think I, I can't hear you sorry it's because my computer audio isn't working so now I have my phone and my computer here. I'm sorry about that. Um, I, I, so I grew up in Cincinnati where it's heavily reformed. And, you know, there was such a distinction between the organs and my conservative synagogue, which was very traditional like ours is. And, and, and so, you know, I've never been able to sort of bring my mind around to the idea of instrumentation on Shabbat. On the other hand, a little drumming wouldn't hurt. And uh, that, uh, I didn't like the music, the instrumentation, the uh, because I felt it sounded tinny and stuff. But I would have loved to have uh, that kind of energy from uh, our chazan, our congregation, for the prayers. It would be really wonderful if we would somehow not just do the traditional, but you know, really throw ourselves into new singing, new ways of getting our congregation to feel energized, so that when they come to services they have an opportunity to do that. And I think another question, of course, is 
if this is a conservative synagogue, how do people who are even our congregants who now have the option to go outside of our congregation and seemingly are doing that, uh, how do they wrap their minds around the fact that we are a conservative congregation or are we, they thinking we're sort of in the dark ages? Yeah. So, it's, you know, it's a two way street for me, but it's, sure. you know, I don't really and, like know, it, so but. Short but I love the is, energy. Short answer is that concern, it's a big tent, a big, a big movement with, with lots of variety in it. Well, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll talk about um, some of this. Uh, uh, anybody else? Uh, either, I saw another hand there. Uh, Bonnie, 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 you want to? Yeah. Yeah. I, I see this as entertainment and I don't see it as people participating. I, I think it's like you go to a show in, uh, in, on Broadway and you, you're watching what's going on, but you're not part of it. And I, I don't think uh, people are really part of it when we have that kind of entertainment in show. Okay. I, mean, so, I, so. I understand everybody get, like getting up and singing together. I understand um, Terry, I think just mentioned that. Um, but this is, people are just sitting there listening. All right. So again, it's important to put, put that moment in context. And, you know, I, I knew that that would be the, the, um, the, the flaw in, in a presentation like this, which is we don't, you know, we didn't see the other two hours of this service, including a 20 minute or 30 minute sermon, you know, and, and listening to the rabbi who is a fine rabbi. Uh, and uh, I'll leave it there with that. But you tell, go ahead. So I, I'm in, in agree with Bonnie that I felt it was more entertaining than davening. But then on the other hand, if I go to a shul where there's a kazan, with a magnificent voice that doesn't allow for community joining in, I also feel as much left out as you could feel from this. When when the chazan is is just there and we just can be observers because it's beyond us. All right. So so it's it's the you know again the the what what has the place of music and specifically solo cantorial music in the in the shul? What 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 is going on there? You know, I think we're all we all react to this uh, on some level. Any other comments uh, and uh, uh, about this, and and then we'll wade into some of these weighty weighty questions. Okay, so um, I'm going to start with uh, with the you know the last two, Gatel, Terry, and and Bonnie, um, and say you know this is a it's a I mean, I, I put it up, it's three minutes of a very entertaining video. Uh, and so my first reaction to it, of course, was like, <laughs> I couldn't believe this. My jaw dropped, my eyes fell out of my head. I couldn't believe this. My head exploded uh, when I saw this. Uh, and and um, I, I've watched it several times now um, to try and figure out exactly what was going on there. Um, and And you know, in the most charitable sense, what was going on is exactly what I said, which is it's the end of the service. It's it's the equivalent of doing a don alum to to I don't know, you know, one of the tunes that that we sometimes use. It's it's that it's that there happened to be the full Kaddish, which is not a don alum, although one could argue a don alum is also a very very sacred, you know, prayer and and uh, has lofty spirituality in it. You know, we do sometimes sing a don alum to. Uh, Yankee Doodle and other kinds of things that, that are there and, and that's part of the fun of, of the shul and you're, you understand that you're ending the service and, and this is the last thing between you and the Kiddush and, and we get that okay um, and I get the fact that um, here is um, really one of the you know, one of the, the great Chazanim in America today, I, I say, uh, Cantor Schwartz is really in the top uh, dozen Chazanim in, in the country, um, an Israeli Chazan, and is known for doing these kinds of things. Uh, he has a rather famous uh, video of doing a donalam to uh, some, some melodies from Hamilton. And uh, that, that the, these are viral YouTube videos. Uh, and that's his shtick. Okay, great. Um, and the other the other point is that that so the the chazan 
is there to create um, a, an experience for the the congregation and the music the musical experience is going to um, be either as broad for a, a variety of individuals and it, it, it it's actually quite complicated to 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 touch all of the notes you know to to speak in this kind of pun way that you need to do um, you need to to the, the Hazan has to has to have a kind of has to has to appeal to everybody he has to he has to be loyal to the cantorial tradition loyal to the nusach which is the the set melodies of 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 the different holidays um and uh and also um push the edge of of the music because it's an art and art always gets its most creative um, impetus from, from being just a little on the edge. And so what you have here is a traditional Hasidic melody set to a swing uh, beat um, and a swing style. And that is the, the collide, the collision is the, 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 encounter of traditional sacred music in the Hasidic upbeat uh, vein with uh, American swing that comes out of its own tradition from jazz and blues and, and the American experience. Um, so so on, on some actually deeper levels, there's something quite fascinating going on here. If I, you know, I, 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 as I said, my first reaction was, oh my God, my, my, my more charitable reaction is that there's something really interesting going on here, which is that that there's a collision here, which is you know between um, this genre and that genre, and something happens, and that is not unusual. In fact, that happens all the time in in music altogether. Part of what you see in Israel now in Israeli music is exactly that, because it's the collision of Eastern and Western music. You get the collision of Arabic and, and uh, European music, and, and all of that makes for new musical forms. It's very, very exciting. So the, the boundary here is really the sacred and the profane, where what Bonnie mentioned was, you know, at what point does the religious experience put its pinky toe into entertainment? And, and um, for me, you know, I, and, and I, you know, just my cards are all on the table here. You know, it, it was obviously clear that um, that Kanta Schwartz, Ozzy Schwartz, was going for the entertainment card. He was playing the entertainment card. You know, the people were, were clapping in their seats. He got a big applause at the end. I mean, it was it was the the joke was on us, really, which is, yeah, I'm doing the Kaddish, but I'm singing it in the swing melody. And, you know, here's the Metropolitan Brass you know, accompanying me and, and we know what's going on here and we're all in on this. And, and um, that, that, that was just out in front. I mean, and, and everybody got it. And if you read the comments in the comment, I mean, the comments are just, you know, exploding with, wow, this is amazing. This is the best. This is great. This is fantastic. This is the best, best thing ever, etc. Why, you know, and then there's also the comment, which is a kind of, why can't it always be this way? Why, why does it always, you know, why, why can't we have this experience all the time? And that's, that's the place where, where uh, we're at, because it's the, the question for me is, well, at what point is religion entertainment? And is there a line between the two? To what extent has that line been blurred in America? To what extent has uh, entertainment and production quality driven the uh, the experience um, and and shaped the experience. Uh, to what extent um, is that a, a a reflection of a greater phenomenon of a marginalization of religion as a kind of re leisure activity? And 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 I you know the last comment which is is religion a leisure activity is. Uh, I, I'm going to put it out as a, a serious um, 
polemical charge against a, uh, a culture in which everything is um, part of the leisure economy and the leisure uh, and, and commodified, including religion. And so we, we, I'm going to, we'll break down into two camps on this. One camp, which is, yeah, well, that's what it is. So embrace it. Or another camp, which is, you know, uh, no, that's not what religion is at all. In fact, religion makes some 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 much more important demands on us rather than uh, titillate us and entertain us uh, for momentary effervescence, and um, and we need to take that seriously. So so that's the the conversation, um, and uh, uh, I, I I'm uh, I'm open to any reaction to what I said. So in other words, at what the question really is. At what point is religion entertainment and at what point is religion not entertainment? It, can we define, is there a boundary line between the two? And if so, what is that boundary line and where is that? What do you think? Go ahead, Ilham. I think it's so much that it's entertainment. I think it's that this is a more familiar music to probably most of the congregation there or, or someone who's unaffiliated or someone who's younger. And this is a way to get them to know, I mean, you learn the words very often because you know the tune, not because you're reading it from the book, but because you're, I mean, when you listen on the radio to, to a pop song, you're not seeing the words, you're following the music and the beat gets you and you start to learn the words that way. So maybe this is a way to engage people into the prayer albeit through the back door, but maybe it's a way of engagement rather than uh, an entertainment. So, so um, I, you're, you're absolutely right. Look, uh, music, uh, I've said this in, in different contexts, I, and, and um, one of the sermons, uh, my second day Rosh Hashanah sermon was that, that music actually is a form of information and that music delivers to us uh, a certain kind of information that that's very hard to articulate, um, especially if you're not musical, and especially if you don't have, you know, the the just the kind of fundamentals. I I I would consider myself musical, musically educated to a point. You know, I don't don't ask me about theory other than what's a major third and what's a perfect fourth and and, and all that. I can I can tell you the difference between a major and minor. I have as much musical, you know, background as, as the majority of people, certainly, you know, not be much more beyond that. And, um, but I can tell intuitively what the information is giving me and where that information collides with certain activity. And so, so with your permission, Ellen, I don't, and I'm just going to bring up a, a, another piece here just to, just to illustrate where uh, this comes from. Okay. And, uh, and, and, and uh, offer, offer that. Okay. So, here we go. Don't be an ad. It's an ad. Okay, sorry. Three, two, one. Okay, here we go. My father sold a lot of coke, but I'm not gonna holler because I still got a dollar. And when I get home, whoa, I get high. My man Sorry, here we go. Last night I ended up in jail, but I ain't got 
Yeah, I know. I I wait about it. If you can go, you can go to the, you can go to the supermarket and and it can happen. You can go to Walmart and it can it can happen. Okay. Yeah. All right. So I love that. And and that was. So, uh, I will, because so, I wouldn't sorry, go in a train, but room. not because of that. I mean, because this can happen uh, sorry, when I'm in mean, uh, whatever, that. anywhere. I need to but, mute. Uh, I wouldn't go in a train a now and sit with right. uh, sick people or something. Rega, 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 so, um, you know, the rabbi is having a class right now. Okay. There, there. I muted. Okay. Sorry. When you want to speak, I'll, I'll open it up. Um, and let me let me speak for two seconds and Marlene has her hand up. So so uh, that was exquisite. Uh, that's a beautiful production. Um, and um, I don't know anything about the group, the speakeasies, you know, just uh, it's uh, but but uh, the, 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 the string here in the conversation is what's the musical, what's the information uh, in in the music? Uh, I, I want to just say it's kind of obvious what the information is there. Uh, nothing wrong with that. Uh, it's gorgeous, voluptuous, it's uh, exquisite, it's, uh, it, it's flirtatious, it's erotic, it's uh, beautiful, it's you know, loaded with sexuality, uh, it's um, uh, joy, it's danger, it's uh, uh, you know, the edge, all of that, which is, you know, full, it's the full human experience in that, which is, you know, why this genre of music is just so, so rich. It's, I mean, if you love music and if you love that, you know, if you love jazz, if you love rock and roll, if you love the musical experience and you are keyed into, to what the information is, it's, it, 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 it entertains you, but it also informs you and it gives you uh, uh, information. So, so my little, uh, my, my, my discussion or my question is that if we have the Kaddish set to swing, we are playing with these, with that kind of information because the swing music, and I, I you know, obviously there's a whole, you know, uh, repertoire of swing which may not be as overtly sexual as what we just saw um although i guess it's part hard to find one that's not um you know it's 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 just obvious to me that that's part of the the information so the play that is happening i don't think it's happening on a conscious level i don't think Ozzy Schwartz said to himself, oh, let's get everybody kind of erotically charged at the end of the service so that they can go home and have lunch. You know, I don't think that's what he's saying. So let's have fun, basically. And it's fun. So he was taking the lowest common denominator of the music, which was fun and putting it there. Nothing wrong with fun, but it's loaded with a whole freight train of other kinds of information. I'm not saying that sexuality and all that is bad. Not at all. It's just that, OK, so you know, should we just accept the fact that that the boundary is has moved and that the the eros and sexuality of swing music gets to go in and this gets to go out or 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 should we just be Puritans and say and, and, and shut the blinds? OK, go ahead, Marlene, react. Go ahead, you have to un unmute. What? Four things. Four things. You're explaining religion with music. And, and so the messages I think are, are double because I, how many of us go away from Yom Kippur singing Anna Bako, ah, Bako. And so then- Excuse me, wait, 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 time out, time out. You would be surprised how many people go out of the service singing the melodies. They may not be singing that melody, but I care, I, I mean, you know, to give you all truth serum and have you admit to yeah la, 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 la. you've all done that on the way home right look i'll just say myself i mean i do i'm doing it you know 
for three weeks before and three weeks after. You know? So you're practicing, but the audience that's coming to this group, if you call us an audience, the audience that's attaching itself to this message of religion, as opposed to being on the beach on that day, I think is an important point. So, and the you know, second and, and, point is, why does all swing music have to be sexually charged? Okay, all right. So, so we'll do the. I first think one. I think you were more impressed, more influenced by the video, also. So, so yes, and okay. So, so I want to, you know, what what Marlene and Ellen, your point also was: look, there, there is a, there is a, there is a constituency within the larger constituency that this appeals to, and that were it not for this, they wouldn't be there. Okay. And that, and and I, I, I get, I give you a, a point for that. That that to me is a very strong and compelling argument, which is, you know, we we want to we want to um, attract people. We want to you know make people feel that this this experience speaks to them. Um, but then you also have people like me in the constituency whose head explodes. Right? When, so when then you'll go it. somewhere else. Well, I can't go. I'm the rabbi. I'm the rabbi of the shul. <laughs> no, it's you know. What would that drive away? No, I it's, look. So I, then, to me, it's the same thing as when you come to services and you're new there, and no one announces the pages. But you don't do page sixteen and seventeen. You go from fifteen to nineteen, and then to twenty-five, and nobody tells you. And I'm sitting there with my hands like this, turning the pages. All right. If it doesn't speak to me, then why would I return? What's the message I'm getting? I'm all getting right. the message that's for you and not for me. So and let me introduce. Off, we say that, Rabbi. If I had not been there. All right, so I'm, I'm accepting that, that criticism and I'm accepting the, the, not the criticism, but the idea. And, and I'll, I'll put it in, in this kind of line, which is that religion, in order for it to be religion and, or, and what has made religion, all religions successful and what has made Judaism successful as one of those religions is that religion is able to meet the demands of individuals in, in large communities on multiple levels simultaneously to enable them to cohere as one community. And I'll take our, our shul as an example. Our shul consists of people who have knowledge. You know, I, my, my example is we have professors of Talmud sitting on the same pew as people who don't know how to read the Aleph bit. And, and religion has to enable the, you know, has to provide something so that the entire community coheres together, that is to say gels together, no matter A, what your knowledge level is, and no matter B, what your kind of religious valence is, and, and there may be, you know, much more. In, in, in pre-modern times, you didn't have to really appeal to so many different kinds of, of, of segments of, of, of an individual, but what makes it absolutely impossible today is that you know it has to it has to do something well to an entire group of people who who have choices and and easily go where they their needs are met so so in in you know in, in just in terms of the local community where you have orthodoxy conservative reform and and other kinds of judaism Obviously, people whose needs are, are not being met by orthodoxy are going to go to other synagogues and, and, and vice versa. So the question is, you know, I, I, I would consider, you know, a, a, a synagogue and a community like the conservative community to be interesting in it because it, it contains the most, the, the, the greatest range of diversity in terms of what the needs are. We are in a in a moment in Jewish history where where the self selection of people is look if you want more and more demands and more content and more intellectual rigor you're going to go to an Orthodox synagogue if you want less and you want more music and and less demands made up on you but more and I'm sorry to say this in a, in a, in a air quotes but more entertainment you're going to go to that kind of synagogue so. You know what do you do in a in a synagogue where yeah I'd, I'd love to have energy like Terry said I'd love to have some you know more sense of joy I also wouldn't I, you know I I I would like to have content 
I don't want to, you know, this week is Parsha Lech Lecha. I just don't want to tell the story of Lech Lecha the way we've always been telling the story. Like, you know, God said, go forth and Abraham go forth and look at Abraham, such a great guy, such a wonderful guy. So he's, he's the most obedient character. And I want to say, no way, this is, it's much more complicated. And you can handle that. We can handle that. We can have more demands made upon us intellectually, spiritually. And, you know, why is it that, that do we, should we cater to the, to the people that are, are not uh, literate in, in the service? Should there be a demand? Should the service, and, I, and this comes up a lot, which is, you know, it's kind of like Marlene's comment, which is you should be more directional in, in what's going on in the service. You know, should the service be more educationally oriented than service oriented? And and so you know the Rabbi answer to that. Word. The answer is if you want a four hour service, yeah, I'll give you a class. Go ahead, Marlene. Go you ahead. could teach more classes per week, and then we would know. There's two different things. Is davening and praying supposed to be educational? Is it religious? Is it spiritual? Or All are the there classes that teach us, and then we go and use that language? I want to say that, that it's all the of the above. And then this we is, can do it. This is this is my point in the in the class, which is religious life is not into is not one corner of your life. Religious re, Judaism informs all of my life. So I'm I'm the rabbi, and I'm I'm replicating myself here on on in in the class, and I'm saying I don't want to come to shul to entertain for, for entertainment. Yeah, he's good and that's great. And I I frankly would rather go to watch the speaking. I'd pay a lot of money to watch those three women in green silk satin and see that experience and have and, and have a great night out. I'd pay a lot of money to see that. And that's entertainment. Okay. Um and yeah I'm I'm I enjoy you know uh, uh, i i don't i don't want to be too critical about you know I, I i love the moments of joy in in and and experimentation in in the service i could do without the brass section and i could do without you know half a million dollars or more in production of television quality production yes let's put it out there that in order to produce the three minutes that you had you need an apparatus of uh, at least a half a million dollars, which Park Avenue can afford in a heartbeat. And uh, on site, they have uh, two or three cameramen and an engineer and a soundboard and a sound engineer. And so there's a whole department now now devoted to that. Uh, I don't have to face this problem because because we we you know a we don't have the money, b we don't have the desire, and c we we obviously you know steered well well away from that. But my buddies. My friends who don't have a half million dollar budgets and who don't have anywhere near access to the talent uh, and who, you know, when you inject them with truth serum will admit, you know, I'm not the most telegenic person in the world. I don't look good on television. And so what they're saying is that now that we've done a year and a half of this, all of our emphasis has become this. And that's a problem, and that's a problem, and and um, and and they don't like it. They don't like it at all because they feel that they've lost something. So in the ascent, in the in the in the attempt to reach to everybody, they've lost the core constituency. The core constituency who has put their body there, has you know made their 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 lives there, have said, yeah, membership in in the community. Uh, is is meaningful to me. I really want. I want something out of a physical experience. I want something out of out of you know being there. And, and of course, you know, I, I, the the heartbreaking part of this is that it's not available to us because of the pandemic. So we've we are in the in 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 the in the moment of discovering new forms of experience that are driven by the experience. Look, Ozzy Schwartz would have probably done uh, the Kaddish to a swing beat, uh, but with less production if there was no uh, uh, online streaming there. I mean, Park Avenue was streaming services 
you know, six or seven years ago. So th this is not new to them. But, but um, you know, the, the shuls that have, you know, star cantors and choirs, what do you, they, they, they spend the month before Rosh Hashanah rehearsing similar stuff without the musical accompaniment. They, they want to have good stuff, but they don't, they're not driven by, well, we think we're going to have 50,000 viewers, so we got to provide something. Otherwise, because uh, synagogue has now become a channel in your, on your living room that you can sit and have coffee in a bathrobe with the New York Times at your side, because that's the experience. And we know that we have to hold people's attention for more than five seconds. So therefore we have to invest huge amounts of money and, 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 and talent in it. So that, that's where we're at. Okay. All right. So, so, you know, it's, it's this, as you can see, is a big, 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 big topic. It has to do with, with religion, uh, you know, emerging there's, there's a, there's a deep philosophical, you know, uh, um, conversation as to the place of religion in our society and how religion has become marginalized because of market forces in our society which have you know relegated religion to one of other experiences and that the religious experience has to compete with um you know the the kind of entertainment uh and uh, effervescence that you get momentary effervescence that you get from a great uh, concert, a great theater performance, a great moment in sport. All of that is what religion used to do, but doesn't do anymore. Uh, and so those experiences are now found in other places. Um, and so there's a, there's a, there's a huge body of, of thinking on, on the transformation that we are experiencing. Okay. I want to um, shift gears completely then and, and go to just a, a, a kind of summative uh, piece of writing that uh, makes it available to, to all of us. Let's see what happens here. Uh, well, uh, here, you think that we have this problem. Uh, the Christian world has this problem uh, much more than we do. This is a, an article. And it, it actually came out um, because of, of a court case, the court cases around COVID and gatherings, uh, they had to decide at large gatherings whether or not the large gathering in the, in the mega churches were either worship or entertainment. So those advocating you know, not shutting down big services said they were worship. And those who, who, who said, no, this is, a, this is a, a super spreader event, were saying it's just entertainment. So I'm just pulling out from uh, an article from Religion News, okay? So Joel Austin's Liquid Church, a Houston megachurch claiming 43,000 weekly visitors, is repurposed sports arena that seats 17,000 people, not counting the thousands more who watch an Austin's program on television. That program consists solely of a lecture by Austin delivered on an empty stage. There are no hymns, no prayers, not even a cross, or are the symbol to suggest what is going on in his worship of God. Those attending in person, however, are entertained off camera by lively music with uplifting lyrics. Austin closed his church doors for a while, but they are wide open for Christmas. At Saddleback Church in Lake Forest, California, originally created by Baptist pastor Rick Warren as a welcoming place for those who don't like church, members of the 20,000 plus congregation prior to the onset of the pandemic were offered a choice of venues from which to worship, depending on whether they preferred Hawaiian, country, Western, traditional, or contemporary Christian music. Otherwise, all heard the same straightforward evangelical sermon piped in from the plain main auditorium. Afterward, they could all mingle over coffee and snacks from a Starbucks-like coffee bar at the center of the church's 128-year campus. There are more than 1,700 megachurches in the United States, and the way many of them acquired mega status was by reserving Sunday worship for elaborate seeker services designed to attract and, yes, entertain people shopping for a church to join a community to belong to or even just the curious. Under this structure, weekday evenings were set aside for small group meetings of the committed for Bible study or other forms of Christian discipleship. Saddleback is just celebrated for its cell-like organization of its most deeply committed members. But under this arrangement, the line between Sunday worship and entertainment is often difficult to discern. Under the First Amendment, citizens are free to worship in any way they choose without government interference. But when civil authorities faced with a killer virus and the responsibility to contain it by limiting large gatherings, see humongous churches, cushion, and fashion like theater auditoriums for, are for audiences, 
No one should be surprised if they, if they analogize houses of worship to that, what takes place in theaters and concert and lecture halls and treat them accordingly. Most Roman Catholic cathedrals are also megachurches, and every Christmas and Easter their pastors see their congregations and collections swell, with lapsed Catholics looking for a nostalgic hour's immersion in the liturgies they once knew as children. Worship is not entertainment any more than religion is a hobby. From the beginning, Christians gathered communally to break bread as Jesus commanded them, and during Roman persecutions, risked their lives to worship him as Lord in underground catacombs. For centuries before them, Jews had likewise gathered to pray and to learn from Torah readings. In that way, they worshiped God and observed his law. Nowhere is it recorded that Christians or Jews or in later centuries Muslims gathered to be entertained. Surely what is called for in these times of pandemic is discernment and restraint on both sides of the church-state divide. Christmas services are special Christian celebrations, but churches would do well this year to apportion places to a limited number of regular worshipers and invite those Christmas and Easter only visitors who come for the entertainment are out of nostalgia to watch television at home. Okay, so, so what that says to me is, okay, Elliot, you're not alone. <laughs> okay, it's, it's, this is, this is, these are issues that, that the, we, are, we all face, all religious communities face. I think Christians have it, have it much more, it's much more complicated in Christianity because the, 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 the desire for, um, you know, the, a broad appeal is, is just much more prevalent in Christianity than it is in Judaism. I think people coming to shul, uh, certainly a shul like ours, um, understand before walking in the door that, that this, the, the, the experience is demanding. It's certainly demanding because it's in Hebrew. It's certainly demanding because, you know, most of it is, it does consist of worship and, and, and reading. Um, it's demanding intellectually because the experience of Jewish uh, religious uh, life is an intellectual experience. Um, and, and people who come to a shul like ours understand that they, 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 that's part of it. In fact, you know, some of the nicest criticisms that I get when it's charitable is, you know, why didn't you give me a sermon? I always want to go out with something to think about. And that, that to me is a, is a great kind of pat on the back, which is, oh, you made me think about something in a new way. And that's why I come to shul. I come to shul to learn. I come to shul not only to experience and to be with people, I come to shul to learn. And, and that, uh, I have to admit, is, is, puts us in a very narrow place on, uh, on, in the market, okay? Uh, it's certainly not where the rest of the market is. The rest of the market is at Park Avenue. I mean, they're, they're voting with their eyeballs. Um, but so, you know, even, even having a very, you know, narrow sliver in the market means, doesn't mean that we don't have to do it well or try not to do it well and try to, to, to be honest about what it is that religion demands of us. Religion demands a, a certain kind of investment of your life. And it's not uh, a passing uh, fad. It's not something that, that you click on and off as entertainment in the most pejorative sense. It's happening in Christianity um, because people feel that they can be Christian and go, and they have, I mean, they love it. They, they're, and they're filled with joy with that and, and more power to them to do that. The question is, so is that the content of the experience? Did, how many of them do come back to Bible study? I, you know, I'm, I'm sure that the most serious among the megachurch pastors want to do the stuff in little community, in, in, in their classes, and they want to build community, and they want people to take care of each other, and they want to, to, to um, energize people to, to their form of tzedakah and mitzvot. Of course they do, right? And that's what it is. So the, the, the mega church apparatus enables them to do that, uh, you know, with, with the resources that, that smaller things don't. So at, at the very least, you know, what we're seeing is the, the pull and the push right now of all of these these trends the tension that exists the you know people who are who who, who want more of a traditional form people who who are you would like to basically throw that in a cannon and 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 launch that out of here um and all of that is is really happening in front of us in addition to the main task which is to provide community 
that coheres with many different aptitudes, tastes, levels, uh, educational backgrounds, uh, you know, uh, charged uh, valences, their own Samsonite collection of baggage relating to their feeling about Judaism, their own negative, you know, experiences uh, and positive experiences and everything in between. So, so tell me that it's simple, right? I put up three minutes of video and thought we'd get entertained. I knew, of course, we would. I knew, I knew it's, it's much more complicated than that. Okay. Any, any reactions to that? Go ahead, Marlene. I would just like to add a hakarat hatov. When you talk about learning, that's why we are so attentive to the things that you say and the lessons that you teach and the way that you find to reach the people who do come. So that the, the comment about we come to hear what you, how you're going to excite us this week intellectually is there. Yeah, but it doesn't reach everybody, you know, and, 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 and look, I, I, I know that because I'm watching and people watch me. And no, I, I see how, how, how lofty my thoughts are because I give them lots of rapid eye movement sleep. I mean, I know what's going on here. It doesn't reach everyone. And, and so I, I know that there's a, you know, we have a small, com, a small sector that, that even does that. And even the sheets, I put out a sheet every week. I, you know, look, I, I, whatever. I mean, so, so, you know, uh, I, this is my Ramah background. I'm sorry to say this. This, this in Ramah, I was taught aim for the highest common denominator, aim for the highest common denominator, and that, and that that may be elitist, and that may be offensive, in the sense that 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 is it exclusionary, and and it, it goes against a certain you know zeitgeist that we have now, which is that you know it's got to be it's got to got to reach everybody, but you can't you can't reach everybody. So if you're not going to reach everybody, then and you still want to make a demand on people say, okay, so what does it cost you? I mean, I, I, I said to people at, at some point, you know, all we're asking you to do, all we're asking you to do is open the book. Open the book. That's it. That was last year. Read the book. Read it. Rap oh, my. Rap yeah, Rabbi, nothing, nothing wrong with high expectations. Okay, so fine, but nothing, but 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 so I, there is plenty wrong with high expectations that the people who don't want that feel tremendously alienated or or imposed upon, and and I, I, there's not much I can do about that other than you know be more tactful in the way I communicate, which I think uh, you know obviously we all you know can can learn to how to do that. Okay, um, and so so. Just one last little thing here. I know we're we're just uh, over here. Uh, where was this? Well, oh, it's I lost. It. Here we go. Uh, this last piece. This is by Rabbi Eric Yaffe, uh, former leader of the the Reform Movement, and he writes an article called "Why Zoom Judaism Will Never Work." This is the leader or one a former leader of the Reform Movement. Uh, what will Judy, Jewish life be post pandemic Jews will run back to the synagogue, he writes. They will not drift back, they will run back. Yes, adjustments will be made. The Jewish communal world will rethink the need for large facilities, reduce infrastructure, cart, digital tools will be more important. Synagogue and JCC memberships will be smaller. All Zoom worship will remain a fixture for those who need it. During the pandemic, the Jewish community needed to be more resourceful, and it was more hybrid and more creative. But what have we learned more than anything else is how much we miss tactile face-to-face -face Judaism. Zoom Judaism is wonderfully convenient, but alas, it is also ultimately religiously unfulfilling and terribly isolating. And precisely because some of us, uh, some of what we have been doing for the pandemic will be permanent, many, many Jews will spend more time working at home, five days a week, two to three days a week. In-person dimension of synagogue will become that much more important. The communal aspect of synagogue is being the beating heart of our Jewish experience. Absent community, Judaism survives barely, if at all. Our ritual is barren, our worship withers, and we struggle to study Torah. Better death than solitude, our rabbis teach, o chavruta, o mituta. This is hardly new insight, of course, but in the last half century, it is something that has become more and more apparent. More Amer most American Jews no longer live in Jewish neighborhoods. They no longer have grandparents who live down the block and who are there for Jewish holidays and babysitting. In this new American reality, despite endless moaning about inadequacies of congregations, the synagogue has become more important than ever. It is there that Jews find community that they've been missing 
help in raising their children, etc. And the pandemic, interesting, has made us appreciate the synagogue in ways that we did not before. We see now more clearly than before that it is the synagogue that enables us to find religious support in a lonely world. It is often the only place that cares about you as an individual, where if you are not there, someone misses you. It is the only one place where no one suffers alone or grieves alone. And on and on and on. What all this means is that when the pandemic is over, it, the synagogue, if it seizes the opportunity, will thrive as never before. It will be uniquely positioned to offer a Judaism that will be desperately needed and personally transformative, built on face-to-face -face encounters. God insisted on meeting Moses panim panim face-to-face, and if Jews of the synagogue wish to retrieve the Jewish soul from oblivion and avail life's fundamental holiness, they will do so as God did, practicing Judaism face-to-face -face and not on the screen. And that's highly provocative. You know, we're not completely there yet. Since we're not completely out of it, I think we'll be, you know, if the trajectory continues the way it is, we will be living with this for, for a while, but, but the numbers will come down within the next two to three months, we hope, uh, and have some semblance of normalcy. But the face-to-face -face demands will compete with the, the, the sense of risk that we have. Uh, and people, of course, as, they, as people have indicated to me personally over the last while, they, they miss it. They miss it de de uh, deeply, um, but they want it back. And they want, they want to have that experience, at least the way we provide it in our shul, not singing uh, Kaddish to swing, but singing Kaddish to, to other good melodies oh, yeah. and having the opportunity to meditate while I give learned discourses on the weekly parsha. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> With that, we will conclude. Rabbi, Let's may I add yes. two things? When I was a child, Rabbi Adler, Ava Shalom, okay. my, my childhood rabbi, someone came up to him and said, oh, Rabbi, I've been away. I was in Florida. Do you recognize me at all? And the rabbi said, here, close your eyes. Let me see. <laughs> yeah. No, that's the way it is. So, so we, I, I, I don't take it personally. I, I just, what I, what I always say is that, that it, it's more a reflection of, of how, how complicated and tired people are and, and, and it has to do with everyone's circadian rhythm and, and, you know, their glycemic index, because, uh, you know, having a, a high sugar breakfast will induce a coma for you right at 1130 when I speak. But well, we do have a baby coming to your class too, Rabbi. Very good. Hey, it's here. so beautiful. Nice to see oh, you. Beautiful. Welcome, welcome, welcome. So we're vouchsafed in the children, right? Vouchsafed. He's right awake, Rabbi. There yeah. you go. There you go. Good enough. All right. Well, it was great to see you all and to uh, get you all kind of riled up a little bit and look forward to doing that on a different topic next week. Okay. Thank you. Right. Right. As the secretary of this group, I'm trying to take an attendance sheet. So if we have to contact everyone in case of any emergency, somebody on a iPad. Uh, Terry said hers was the iPhone. Who's the iPad? I don't know who that is. We'll have to find out. Okay. Right, I'll send a message. It's Eva Ronen. Oh, Eva Ronen. I'm sorry, Eva Ronen. it's who? Eva Ronan, Eva Ronan. Oh, okay, thanks. Glad you're here, Eva. One calendar Hi. note is November the 10th. Is that the, the, I won't be here. I won't, I, I'm going up to see my mother in Ottawa. So I wish I could do, I, I, unfortunately, I'll be traveling at the time when I give the class, but, uh, uh, in, you know, being able to do it on Zoom means that even if I go up on a Monday, I'll be able to do the class from Ottawa on a Tuesday. Okay. All right. Very nice. We know what your what your mother's living room looks like. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yes, your cock, Rabbi. Thank have you. A great day, Thank everybody. you. Talk to you. Thank you. And Maya was great. She was fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. She is cute. Look at that. <laughs>